Is she prepared to testify? Very good. Let's have her in. You may.
Thank you. Please be seated. We're back on the record in the matter of State of Utah versus Martin McNeil. He is present with his counsel. The state's attorneys are present. The jury is seated. Ms. Walthall has been sworn and has taken the witness stand. You may examine her. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, Mrs. Walthall, will you state your name, please? Anna Walthall. Thank you. Will you spell it? A-N-N-A W-A-L-T-H-A-L-L. -L. Thank you. Um, what city do you live in? Texarkana, Arkansas. All right. And uh, back in um, 2004, 2005, where did you live? I lived in Park City. Okay. Park City, Utah? Utah. Um, <clears throat> did you know Martin McNeil back then? I did. Will you describe how you met? Um, I had a laser hair removal clinic here in Salt Lake, and he was my medical director. Okay. Um, <clears throat> what was going on with your with the uh, with your laser hair removal clinic at that time? Um, well, I opened it in late two thousand four, I believe. Okay. And it did not do well, so I closed it in probably October of two thousand five. All right. What else was going on in your life at this time? Whether you were uh, interacting with Dr. McNeil? Um, I was going through a divorce. Okay. And was this a, an amicable separation, or how would you describe the divorce? No, it was terrible. Okay. Um, so did your relationship with Dr. McNeil move anywhere beyond a uh, professional relationship as an employee of yours? It did. Will you describe how that happened? Um, he knew my ex-husband and was helping my ex-husband um, with the stress of going through a divorce. Uh, sustained. Let's okay. let's talk about let's talk about you and Martin. How did your how did your relationship develop over time? Um, he was a, he volunteered to be a liaison between my ex and me, and so we um, had more of a personal relationship because of that. He knew what where my ex was, and um, then he ended up volunteering to help me with communicating and working out the divorce decree, and I eventually... It's non-responsive and yep. irrelevant. Uh, Sustained. It's a narrative answer. Let's okay. proceed. As you, uh, uh, as Dr. McNeil took on some more, I guess, personal roles in your life, um, uh, did your relationship become something more than? Um, yes, I became personally involved with him. Personally involved. Okay. Yes. Did that relationship ever, ever become sexual? Yes, it did. Okay. Is it fair to say that you and Dr. McNeil began uh, an affair? Yes. Okay. Roughly, when did that begin? Um, March of 2005. Okay. And about when did it end? I moved away from Salt Lake in um, October of 2005. So I may have seen him once after that, and we may have talked on the phone, but basically. By that point, it's ending? Yes. If not ended, it's on its way out. Right. Okay. Um, <clears throat> did you and Martin have um, intimate conversations during this uh, during this affair? We did. Uh, did these conversations include deep subjects like religion, death, life ambitions, things like that? Yes. When did the conversations like that usually occur? Um, pillow talk. Okay. Okay. Uh, just to make sure we have a clear record, will you describe what you mean by pillow talk? Objection, Your Honor. Relevancy. Uh, she may answer. Overruled. Um, you know, after you have sex and you're just laying there okay. and you feel close okay. and you talk a little more openly. Sure. I, I know what it means. I just want to make sure anybody reading the record would know what it means. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to have you, I'm going to actually ask you to zero in on one conversation specifically. Um, 
did ever did Martin ever describe to you a process of uh, making someone have a heart attack? Yes. Um, will you tell us what he said to you about that subject? Um, that. But let me. I'm sorry. Let me pull back. Do you recall where you were when this conversation took place? At my house. Uh, in Park City. Yes. Okay. Do you recall about when this would have happened? I can guess, but I can't recall. Okay. Uh, fair to say it's sometime within that March to October time yes. period. Um, do you, can you narrow it down any? Probably more closer than that? to October. Okay. Um, okay. Now, specifically about what he said about inducing a heart attack, what did he tell you? There's something you can give someone that's natural, that's there after they have a heart attack, so that it's not detectable after they have a heart attack. Okay, so you can give someone some sort of substance that's yes. naturally occurring in the body, mm -hmm. and it would be there after the heart attack, but it would also start a heart attack. Yes. And so you could cause someone to have a heart attack, and the drug would supposed to be there anyway, and so you wouldn't be able to tell. That's correct. Okay. Um, <clears throat> will you just give us a summary about how your affair with Martin ended? You mentioned you moved in October of 2005. Yes. Is that, uh, did, did you discuss with Martin his maybe moving with you? Um, yes, we talked about it. And it was, you know, he didn't make a commitment to do that. I just knew it was a possibility. Okay. Um, but he never committed to you saying, yes, I'm going to leave Michelle and come with no. you. No. Um, how, how did you feel about that at the time? Um, you know, the Question, whole... Your Honor, I don't think that her feelings are relevant. Sustained. Your Honor, I think it speaks to her uh, motivation, potential bias for being present and testifying. Um, her, at this point, her motive hasn't been impeached, okay. sustained. I have no other questions. Thank you. I'm sorry, can I have one minute, Your Honor? You may. Anything further? Yes, please, Your Honor. Go ahead. Um, this conversation about the heart attack uh, and starting a heart attack, did Martin ever say anything to you about whether that would be able to kill somebody? I don't recall. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. You may cross. Morning. Morning. You've talked with the investigators a lot in this case, haven't you? Yes. And uh, you've um, shared dreams uh, that, that you have had about um, the case, correct? Yes. And, and you've shared dreams of things that, that you thought were, were of evidentiary value. Possibly. For example, um, uh, you sent um, an email uh, to the investigators saying that uh, you had a dream and you want to tell, tell you, the investigators, that there is evidence from a computer which will clarify exactly what happened to Michelle. I did write that. Yeah, about a dream you had, right? Yes. And you uh, sent another dream or another email to them saying that you had another dream and, and uh, you're wondering about uh, the autopsy. Does it say anything about Michelle's toes, correct? I did write that. Yeah, and then uh, another dream about, is there anything in the mix about a, a, a white Toyota? I did write that. And you've been um, diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder, correct? I have. What, what used to be called multiple personality disorder? Possibly. Yeah. 
If it was, it was inaccurately called that. Okay. okay. And uh, you've also written in, in emails uh, to the investigators that uh, you want him, referring to, to Mr. McNeil, you want him convicted for killing Michelle, right? Um, what probably, you said. probably. And you also wrote in an email to them that, that you're really excited about the prospect of Martin being off the streets for a very long time, right? Probably. You testified at the preliminary hearing about um, this discussion that Mr. Perkins asked you about in relation to um, um, some chemical that could possibly start a heart attack, right? Yes. At the preliminary hearing, you said that uh, you don't remember when that conversation would have occurred, correct? That's correct. Same thing I said today. Okay. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Any redirect? Yes, please, Your Honor. Mr. Spencer asked you about dreams that you related to investigators. Uh, do you think the content of dreams should be used as evidence? Never. Um, what, what was your purpose for writing about that to the investigators? You know, I was processing, and sometimes I just give too much information. Sure. Okay. Did you think it might lead them to evidence? Um. Maybe. Trying to be helpful? Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you know whether any of these dreams produced any evidence? No. I have no idea. Okay. Um, <clears throat> did you dream about uh, Martin saying that he knew how to induce a heart attack in a way that was undetected? That, that testimony that you gave earlier, did, was that a dream? No. Okay. Do your, did your dreams affect your testimony at all? No. Um, <clears throat> Dissociative identity disorder and multiple personality. Um, you said that that's an inaccurate characterization or an inaccurate name for it. Yes. Um, <clears throat> have you been diagnosed with anything like multiple personality disorder? I have been diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder. Okay. Can you briefly tell us how that's different from multiple personality or what's commonly understood to be multiple personality? Uh, multiple personality is an old diagnosis that was an inaccurate diagnosis, so inaccurate and it's not reflective of the condition that they were trying to name. They've gotten rid of it. So they just got rid of it. Okay. Um, <clears throat> will you, um, do you work now? Not currently. Okay. Have you worked in the past? Yes. Besides the Sonic Clinic, have you run other businesses? Yes. Um, um, Will you, what type of education do you have? I have two bachelor's degrees. What are they in? One's in business and one's in music. Okay. Um, <clears throat> have you raised a family? Yes. Uh, are you currently raising a family? Yes. Uh, how does your diagnosis affect all of those things, if it does? I'm sure that it does, but it doesn't render me unable to function. I mean, maybe I think something's funny when it's not, or, you know, okay. it affects every day, but it doesn't, it doesn't determine whether I, I have a relatively normal life. Okay. Um, does it affect your ability to perceive the difference between reality and fantasy? Does not affect my ability. What about truth and falsehood? No, I know truth and falsehood. Okay. What you've said about the conversation you had with Martin um, about the heart attack, is that the truth? Yes. Thank you. Any recross? No, nothing further. Any questions, ladies and gentlemen, for this witness? May she be released? You'll be... Any objection from the defense to releasing her from a trial subpoena? No, Your Honor. You'll be released from your trial subpoena, which means you won't be called back here. You may step down. Thank you. Next witness. State calls Alexis McNeil, or excuse me, Alexis Summers.
Ms. Summers, if you'll come forward here to the clerk's desk, please. Raise your right hand and take an oath. Thank you. If you'll be seated here, please. Good morning. Good morning. Will you please give us your name? Alexis Michelle Summers. And Alexis, how do you spell your last name? S-O-M-E-R-S. Uh, were you formerly known as Alexis McNeil? Yes. Okay. Uh, when did the name change occur? Um, I legally changed my name, I believe it was in 2010. Okay. Um, are you employed, Alexis? I am. How are you employed? Um, I work at um, Intermountain Healthcare Clinic. And uh, what is your position? I'm a you, go ahead. Oh, I'm a family medicine physician. So you're, you're a Dr. Summers? Yes. In effect, okay. Uh, can you talk about, so you, you practice medicine, and, and what is your position there? What is your daily routine there? Um, well, I'm currently on maternity leave, but um, normally I see outpatient, it's an outpatient clinic, so I see patients all day long in clinic. Okay, and how long have you been there? Um, I just finished my residency um, in August and they let me stay on um, for a couple months until my twins were born so um, I've officially been a doctor out of residency for about four months about four months okay. uh -huh. I'm gonna take you back a little bit um, more with respect to your schooling okay okay um, do you have an under undergraduate degree I do and what is that um, I have an undergraduate degree from Brigham Young University in history okay and you recall when you graduated? Um, I graduated in 2003. Okay. And what about post-graduate school? Yeah, I did a master's degree um, in the history of medicine at Imperial College in London. Do you, do you remember when you graduated from that college? Um, I got my degree in 2005. Okay. And then you went to medical school? Yeah, I where started. Did, where did oh. you go to medical school? Um, Toro University in Henderson, Nevada. I started the fall of 2006. Um, what is your relationship to Michelle McNeil? Uh, she's my mother. Okay. And your relationship to Martin McNeil? He's my father. And is he in the court today? He is. Uh, where is he seated? Um, he's seated to your left. Is it to my right? Or to your right, sorry, my left. Uh, he's yeah. wearing a blue tie? He is. Thank you. Um, can you describe your relationship with your father growing up what that was like um, I had a, a very close relationship with my father um, I, I kind of tagged along with him a lot at work um, kind of went into medicine because of my father um, he was someone who who I loved and respected and and relied on and and someone who I always wanted um, to be proud of me I'm going to be asking you, Alexis, uh, several questions about events that occurred years ago. Okay. Um, surrounding your mother's death. Mm -hmm. Do you have a memory of that time period? I do. Okay. Is it a perfect memory? Um, it's almost been seven years, so not 100% perfect, but... Okay. Um, let's start off with April 11th, 2007. Do you recall that day? I do. Okay. And what's significant about that day? Um, that's the day my mother died. Okay. Do you recall where you were when you first heard of your mother's death? Uh, yeah. Tell us about that. Um, I was in my, uh, I was in a neurology lecture. I just finished up a neurology lecture in at, at my school in in Henderson, Nevada. Um, when I found out. Okay. How did you find out? Um, I called home, okay. and uh, my dad answered the phone and said, your mother's in the tub and she's not breathing, and hung up the phone. Um, what did you do? I screamed. I dropped my bags and um, just ran, ran to get in my car to drive to the airport. Okay. 
to fly home. Do you recall about what, what time of day this was? It was morning. It was morning? Morning, late, late morning. Okay. Now, um, Henderson, Nevada is that Pacific time zone? It is. So it would be an hour delayed from, or an hour behind the mountain time zone of Utah? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. So if it's an noon... An hour earlier. Okay. An hour earlier. That's what I meant. Yeah. So if it's 12 noon here, it's 11 a.m. there. That's correct. Okay. Um, you said you dropped everything and ran to the airport. What, did you get a flight to Utah? Um, I did. Okay, tell us, tell us what happened. Um, Describe that day a little bit, like what happened next. After, after I got to the airport or flew, flew home. Either one. Um, well, it, initially when I talked to, with my father and he said, your mother's not breathing, and, um, and I dropped my things and ran, I didn't know at that time that she was, she was dead, but I did call back several times, um, okay. I believe the home phone, my father's cell phone. Um, at some point, someone answered the phone, or I, my father, I think, answered the phone, but someone else picked up and was talking to me, and I was just screaming, saying, is she okay, is she okay, and... and did, did this individual say something to you, Re yeah. report to you? What did he say? He said that it doesn't look good. Uh, she doesn't look good and to come home. Um, so then I continued to drive to the airport, and I was continuing to make phone calls, just trying to figure out what my mom's status was. Um, when I got to the airport, uh, that's when I did get the official um, st or the official call saying that my mom had had died. Do you know who made that call to you, or who you talked to? Um, I called the the hospital. I knew she was being transported to the American Fork Hospital. Um, and I called the emergency room, and I believe it was um, I believe it was my brother Damien that was there that um, that told me she's she's dead. Okay. So did you eventually get a flight? I did. And you returned. Yes. Um, upon returning to Utah, you, did you fly into Salt Lake? I did. I what, what did you do next? Um, a neighbor uh, or an old neighbor friend, Chris Anderson, uh, picked me up from the airport and drove me right to the house in Pleasant Grove. Okay. I'm going to stop you there and, and then take you back. Um, this was the date of April 11, 2007, correct? That's correct. When your mom died. And, and you were in Henderson, Nevada. Mm -hmm. And Henderson's a suburb of Las Vegas? Yeah, it's about 15 minutes outside of Las Vegas. Okay. Had you previously been in Utah in the previous days leading up to your mother's death? Yeah, I had just flown back um, the night, on the night of the 10th to Las Vegas. I'd been in, in Utah for a little over a week. Okay. Um, at this time in your life, uh, you were in school? Yes. Okay. Were you in medical school? I was. And where, where were you in, in the process of medical school? Um, I was finishing up my first year of medical school. I believe I had about six, six weeks left um, before I had my summer break. Okay. When you were in Utah in the in the days before your mom's death, was that a vacation from school or was that a break from school? What were the circumstances? Um, it was a, the school did have a spring. I believe it was a spring break um, during that week, but I went up specifically for um, another reason. What was the purpose that you so you, so there was a reason you came home during that spring break? Yes. Okay, and what was the purpose? Um, my mom was getting a facelift. Okay. And uh, do you recall when you returned home, approximately the date during that spring break? When I returned home? Yeah. Back to ne Nevada? When you returned, oh. excuse me, returned, when you... When I, f when I flew up to, to Utah. To be present for the face. Okay, yeah. Um, it was around the beginning, beginning of April. Okay. I don't know the specific date. Okay. But it was before her surgery. Okay. Um... Let's talk just a little bit about that. Um, now, we talked about the home. Where, where is the family home that we're talking about? Um, this is 3058 North Mill Creek Road in Pleasant Grove, Utah. Okay. And at that time, who was living in the home? Um, at that time, my, my mother and father, and then my four little sisters, Elle, Sabrina, Giselle, and Ada. Okay. 
Uh, so you return home for spring break. Mm -hmm. And uh, first off, let me ask you, when did you, when did you first find out about your mom, uh, mom's plastic surgery, that she was going to have surgery? Just a couple of days before the actual surgery. Okay. And do you recall how you found out? Um, yeah, I got a phone call from my mom. Okay. So you were informed of that. Um, did you interact with your mom and your dad in the days leading up to the surgery? Yes, I did. Okay. Uh, did you attend any preoperative me me preoperative meetings with the surgeon that would perform the surgery? I did. Okay, let's talk about that. Okay, um, do you recall approximately what they what that date was in relationship to the surgery? I believe it was April second, so the day before the day before my mom's surgery. Okay, so surgery took place April third. Mm -hmm. And uh, what did you do on that day? Um, I drove with with my parents um, to the consultation. And where was this consultation at? Um, I believe the consultation was in Draper. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, do you recall the physician's name, the surgeon's yeah, name? Yeah, Dr. Scott Thompson. Okay. Um, so you, you were driving with your parents. Did you overhear a conversation uh, or inter an interaction between your parents during that drive? I did. What was that about? Um, my mom was hesitant to get the surgery. Um, she was talking to my dad, um, saying that maybe we should delay the surgery um, until this. Well, yeah, a few things. Um, she wanted to maybe push it back until the summertime because I would be home for, you know, almost a three month period. And then she also had been recently diagnosed with some mild hypertension and wanted to make sure her blood pressure and things would be under control. And then also, she wanted to lose some weight before having the surgery. And your dad was present? He was. He was listening to this? Yeah. Uh, do you, did he have a reaction? Yeah, he had a very strong reaction. What, what was that reaction? He got really angry at my mom and said, no, you cannot do that. If you don't uh, have the surgery now, you're not getting it. Um, he was raising his voice and very animated and also said that um, he had already paid for the anesthesiologist and the operating suite. Um, and then he also said that uh, if, we, if we didn't go through with the surgery, Dr. Thompson would be out a lot of money. Okay. Um, eventually, did you attend this consultation? I did. With Dr. Thompson? Mm -hmm. okay. Tell us about this consultation. Who, who was present and just tell us about what happened. Um, Myself, my mother and father, and I believe Ada was there as well. Okay. Or maybe, I'm not 100% if Ada was there. Um, but um, during the consultation, you know, the doctor just talks about, you know, different things to expect. Um, he was getting medications ready for her, for or the prescriptions ready for her, um, so she could have them after her surgery. Who was that that was doing that? Dr. Thompson was writing the prescriptions. Okay. Let's talk about that just for a moment. Mm -hmm. um, your father was present in, during this meeting. That's correct. Uh, did you overhear him speaking to the doctor about prescription medications? Yes. What happened and what did your father say? My father had a list of medications that he had prepared previously that he wanted uh, Dr. Thompson to prescribe. When you say he prepared, pre prepared that previously, how do you know that? Um, I had seen him writing them down um, a couple days before. I don't know if it was a couple days or the day before, but I had uh, seen him um, in his room writing medications down that he wanted the doctor to prescribe. Um, when you observed him writing these medications down, was there was he referencing anything? Yeah, he had a physician's desk reference um, that, that he was flipping through. Is that referred to as the PDR? Yes. And uh, what is the PDR? Um, it's it's a list of pretty much all of the medications out there. Their um, indication, indicated uses, the side effects, the warnings. Kind of when you get um, when you pick up a prescription, when you get that that little paper that comes with it that has a million things written on it. The insert. The insert. Basically, it's all of those. 
um, about all the medications that are out there that are being used. Is this a, is this a big book? It's it's very big and thick. Very mm -hmm. thick book. And you mentioned that this was at the house, so there was yeah. a PDR at the house. Yeah, there was. It was just something that I mean I remember it because it was surprising because I've not seen him reference a, a PDR in probably 10, 15 years. Okay. And it was dusty as well. Okay. So your father was referencing that and making a list. Yes. Okay. Back to the consultation. Mm -hmm. um, did you, what did your dad say to Dr. Thompson about this? He said that he wanted just to make sure that my mom had all the medications that she would need and he wanted him to prescribe certain medications. Do you recall what those were? Um, some of them were like Phenergan, Lortab, uh, Lortab liquid, um, and you know, a couple other medicines he had. Uh, also, Ambien and Valium. Okay. Um, are you aware as to whether or not those prescriptions were were written out? Yeah, uh, Dr. Thompson, I, w I was actually, I was really embarrassed because my dad was telling the plastic surgeon what medication he wanted. It was, I was, I vividly remember this and it was... And embarrassed you because of why? Why did that embarrass you? Well, he's a plastic surgeon. I mean, he knows what medications are appropriate to prescribe. Um, it wasn't my dad's place to do that and I just thought it was really strange and embarrassing. And then he had he had Dr. Thompson, hand, they were all handwritten prescriptions. And um, when he got the prescriptions, he looked down and saw that Dr. Thompson spelled my mom's name with two L's. And so he asked doc, Dr. Thompson to rewrite every single prescription. And it was probably eight to 10 prescriptions. And I was just really embarrassed that he was having him rewrite it out as well. Okay. With respect to uh, prescriptions, um, do you have any knowledge as to whether or not your father had prescribed family members, your family members' prescriptions in the past? He had. Okay. But not on this date? Not on this date. Okay. Um, do you have any knowledge as to whether or not your father was a primary care physician for your family? Or Yeah, I mean, we never went to any other doctor growing up. I don't remember ever going to a doctor. It was always my dad who would, And so, you know. so what is a primary care physician? As, that's, as that phrase is understood. A primary care physician um, is someone that takes care of a um, specific population of patients. With uh, me, a family medicine doctor, I you can do, you know, OB obstetrics, uh, pediatrics, and, you know, also, you know, just kind of see patients throughout their whole lives. Geriatrics as well. Primary care physician is kind of the first physician you go to if you have an issue. And that was your father for your family? Yes. Okay. And I know my mom, you know, had been prescribed medications by him in the past. Okay. Um, Did your mom ultimately have surgery then? She did. Uh, let's talk just a little bit about that. You mentioned it was April 3rd. It was April 3rd. 2007. That's correct. Um, can you describe kind of what happened that day? Um, yeah, uh, the surgery began pretty early in the morning. Um, my father, myself, and my mother, we drove up to Bountiful. It was at the Lakeview Hospital. Okay. Um, my dad dropped uh, my mom and myself off. And uh, I stayed with her until she went in to the surgery. He, he left and went, went, said he needed to get back to work. Okay. And do you recall how long the surgery was? It was, it was a long surgery, probably like six to eight hours. Um, I was there all day. Okay. And your father was not? Where no. was your, do you know where your father was? Um, he said he needed to go back to work. Okay. Um, did you have any interaction with Dr. Thompson about the surgery? I did. He'd come out periodically just to let me know how things were going. Okay. Um, to your knowledge, was it a successful surgery? Yeah. Okay. 
Okay. Yeah, he said he was happy with every how everything went. Okay. What happened after the surgery that day? Um, yeah, she, so she, after the surgery, she went into the recovery room and um, was in a little bit of pain and groggy and and she um, she wanted to stay the night at the hospital. Um, we'd previously had an outpatient surgery, thought we'd probably be taking her home, but um, my mom said she didn't want to drive an hour. It, the Bountiful was about an hour away from Pleasant Grove, didn't want to have to make that drive that night and wanted to just stay overnight at the hospital. Okay. Uh, was your father present during this conversation? Um, yes. So he had returned? He had returned that day. Uh -huh, to what, pick us up. What happened after that? Oh, he got upset. He was, he was mad at my mom. He uh, said we need to go home. He didn't want her to stay overnight. Okay. Um, was, there, did you, was there a collective decision that was ultimately reached? Yeah, so um, he called and talked to Dr. Thompson. Who was that? Uh, who, who called? Who called? Uh, believe my dad did. I know Dr. Thompson was on speakerphone and I was right there with him. Okay, do you remember where this was? Was this at the hospital? It was at the hospital. Uh -huh. it, I, it may have been it may have been in the car in the parking lot. Um, not a hundred percent sure of exactly where I was. Okay. But it was at Lakeview Hospital. And what was the substance of the conversation between your father and Dr. Thompson? Um, my father was just talking to him about you know how my mom wanted to stay overnight. Um, Dr. Thompson said he thought that'd be a good idea. Okay, so did she stay overnight? She did after after I had a conversation with my dad because he was very reluctant. He didn't want her to stay, and I said, well, "What's the big deal? You know, we have good insurance. It's just staying for one night for observation." He was very angry. He wanted. He wanted her to come home, but then after he talked to Dr. Thompson, and Dr. Thompson thought that that would be a good idea, he kind of changed his mind. Okay. Um, did you stay at the hospital that night? I did. First I had to. Uh, my dad said he needed to get home. He couldn't stay that night uh, with my mom, uh, so I had to drive him down uh, from Bountiful to Pleasant Grove, drop him off, and then I drove back up to Bountiful to be with my mom that night. Okay. Um, when did Michelle return home to Pleasant Grove after the surgery? She returned home the next morning. Okay. And um, did you drive her home or? I did. Okay. Did you have the vehicle? Yes. And having come back up the night before? Yeah, I had the Suburban. Okay. Um, what was your role with respect to your mom in, in the days that followed the surgery? Um, I was pretty much her, her caregiver. I'd um, help her give her the medications that she needed, um, help her with her eye ointments. Initially, um, when she came home, her eyes were bandaged, so she wasn't able to, to, to see. Um, so I had to help her, you know, go to the bathroom and, and do things like that. Can you describe these bandages, what they looked like? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was some gauze around her eyes, um, and then she had an ace wrap. She also had some gauze around her forehead area, and then, uh, believe, another ace wrap around her forehead. Was she effectively blind? Yeah, she couldn't see with the, because it was gauze and the ace wrap. Okay. Um, she was like that her first day yes. coming home. Do you know how long she continued to have those bandages on her eyes and face? I'm not 100% sure, but within, you know, 48 hours, she no longer had those bandages on her eyes. She still had the the, ban the gauze and bandage around her head this way. Oh, sorry. Okay. But she could see within about 48 hours? Yes. Okay. Um, let's, that first day home, uh, do you recall that day? what you were doing with your mom? Yeah, I mean, I was I was helping her, was taking, I, I made sure I w really wanted to to do a good job helping her out. I mean, she was, she was my mom. Um, so, I mean, I was taking her, her vitals, her blood pressure, pulse, doing things like that, you know, rubbing her legs and. What was the purpose for rub rubbing her legs? Well, I wanted to make sure that 
she would have good circulation. So, you know, you can ha you can develop a blood clot if you've been sedentary for, for quite a while. So I wanted to make sure that she didn't get any a blood clot. And what's the will risk you, of a blood clot? I'm clot? sorry, will you make a record of her description of the bandages? She made a yes, I motion will. around her head. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, for the record, the witness described that um, she pointed to her face, to her eye areas, uh, when she discussed the gauze being on top of the eyes. She then discussed an ace bandage that was wrapped around her head in sort of a horizontal fashion around the head over the eyes. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe she also described an ace bandage that was wrapped around her chin mm -hmm. and came up above her head as well. Is that's that accurate? That's correct. Ms. Summers? And when, when the bandage, you, you testified that she could see after 48 hours. Was there any bandages over her eyes at that time, or was it just the bandage around her head and jaw? Just the bandage around her head and jaw, I believe. I mean, she did have a few little starry strips, sort of just like a little bit of tape around some of the incision areas as well. Okay. Let's talk just a Thank little you. bit about the eyes uh, for more clarification. Mm -hmm. um, why did she have to have bandages on her eyes? Were there incisions on her eyes or right near her eyes? Um, yeah, I believe, do yes. You, do you recall well, the location of those incisions? You know, I don't recall 100% the location, but I did have to dress little wounds around her eyes and face area. Anything in the eyelid area or the eyebrow? Mm -hmm. do, you, do you recall having to dress wounds in that area? Um, gosh, I'm, I believe, I believe so. I believe that was where the standard incisions were, but I don't remember 100%. Okay, okay. Um, did you continue to care for her throughout that day? I did. The day after surgery, so we're talking about April 4th. April 4th, uh-huh. 2007. Uh -huh. um, what about into the night? Um, no, I wasn't able to care for her at night. And why not? Um, because my, my father told me I needed to leave. Um, he said that he would be taking care of my mom and that um, I needed to go and get some sleep. Okay. you recall about what time of day this was or what time of night? Not 100% sure, but it was, it was in the night. It was dark out? Like it was dark out, yeah. Okay. And... Uh, what did you do? Well, first I said that I didn't want to leave my mom. Um, we had it set up in, in her room where there was a hospital bed, and it was right next to a, a couch. And I had just planned on sleeping on the couch and being there for her so I could take care of her. I said, no, Dad, I have, you know, I'm just going to stay here with Mom so I can help her. Was this in a bedroom? This was, the, yes, this was in, in my parents' bedroom. Okay. So... You had this conversation with your dad, mm -hmm. and you can continue. What what happened? He insisted that I leave. Um, he pretty much forced me out. Okay. And what did you do then? I went to my little sister's room. That was, um, there was a bathroom, and then my sister's room was right uh, next to that on the same floor. Um, I went to her room, and I, I slept there that okay. night. Uh, did you sleep soundly that night? Your, your record. You know, I don't remember not sleeping soundly, so I, oh, it was uncomfortable. I was on Ada's little princess bed that was a double bed, so we were both squished on there. I don't know how comfortable I was, but. Okay. Um, do you remember waking up the next day? I do. And do you recall about what time that was? Early, um, probably around 6 in the morning. I'm a early. So this would have been April 5th now? Yes. Okay. And what did you do upon waking up? I went right into my mom's room. Okay. And what did you see? Um, I saw my mom, and she appeared to be very sedated. When you say she appeared to be, how did you come to that conclusion? I went over there and tried to wake her up, and she wasn't, she wasn't waking up. Did you do anything physically to try and wake her up? I shook her a little bit. Okay. And how did she respond to that shaking? She make, made a few little sounds and moans, but she would not wake up. Uh, did you say anything to her as you were trying to wake her up? Um, 
if you recall. I, I, you know, I don't recall. I don't recall, but I'm, I'm sure I was saying mom, mom. Okay. But, sorry. What happened next? Um, I checked her vitals. You know, she was breathing, um, and her blood pressure was okay. Her pulse was a little low, but okay. Um, and she, uh, Yeah, that's, that's about what I did. And then I went to talk with my father. Okay, before we go there, um, you're in your first year of medical school. That's correct. You're about to complete the first year. Mm -hmm. um, did that um, experience, was that simply classes or did you do something that was practical in addition to just going to lectures and tests and things? No, we had, we had you know, physician shadowing opportunities and physical exam classes where where we, we learn the basics of, you know, examining patients. and. Okay. Are you able to uh, uh, indicate what your training and experience and education would be at that point in medical school compared to a nurse? It would probably be pretty comparable at that, at that point. I mean, for learning, you know, the basics. I know there are very specialized nurses as well who have a lot of training and experience, but you know, I knew, you know, the basics. Okay. So you went to speak with your father. Um, describe what happened there. Um, yeah, I went to my father and I said, what happened? Uh, obviously, mom is over-medicated. And did he respond? He said, yeah, and he did respond, yes. Um, he said, yeah, I think I gave her too much medicine. I must have given her too much medicine. Did you um, give, excuse me, did you follow up and ask about what, med what medicine? Yeah, I said, what did you give her? Okay. And do you recall what he said? Um, he said, gave her uh, Lortab, Valium, Ambien, and then I believe he said that she threw up, and then he gave her some liquid Lortab. I believe he gave her Phenergan and Arnica as well. Arnica. Do you recall him indicating whether or not he had given her Percocet? I believe he said he gave her Percocet. I, I wrote down what he told me he gave her. Okay, let's talk about that for just a minute. Mm -hmm. um, what, what was this that you wrote down the medications on? I wrote it on a green, pres uh, not a prescription pad, but a, um, I think it was like a Zyrtec uh, pad of paper. Um, and was there a purpose beyond just writing down what your father had told you that morning for this pad of Zyrtec? Yeah, well, I, I wanted to make sure that I, like I said, do a good job taking care of my mom. And so I would write down um, all the medications that I was giving her. When, and what time that I was giving her. When did you start doing that? I, down the I started doing that right away when when uh, she'd come home. When she came home. Uh -huh. okay. Did you continue to write down these medications that were administered to you? I did. Okay. Um, apart from what your dad described as far as what he gave to her, mm -hmm. um, did, you, um, did you administer the medications to your mom in the days that followed? Yes. Okay. Well, because I told him, I said, after he said, yeah, I did give her too much medicine, I said, well, you're not to give her any more medicine. I'm taking over. Okay. And you continue to document this on the Zyrtec pad? I did. Was there something that changed? Did you use something else to document what you were doing for your mother? Yeah. I was using another, um, another book as well. It was a little black book that had a gray prescription, or a gray pad of paper on it that was lined um, and I was putting her vitals and different things what she was eating things like that in that in that uh, uh, paper or in that in that little black book okay. uh-huh I decided I just wanted to have a more accurate detail of not only what went what time I gave I gave my mom the medications but I wanted it to be just in the same book as her, where her vital signs were and what food I was giving her. So I just kind of wanted to clean up the book a little bit. So I, I made this uh, other copy of this in this black book of the medications that she, I was giving her 
and her vitals, and what she was eating and drinking. Okay. Um, do you recall whether or not your dad told you, he, he said that he, he must have over-medicated your mom? That's what he told me. Uh -huh. Describe the drugs. Did he tell you when he was giving these drugs to your mom? Yeah, I said, well, I, well, I asked him. I said, what time? And I think he kind of gave me a rough estimate that I wrote down as well. Do you, do you happen to recall those times? Um, I believe it was midnight and midnight to 1 a.m., something around that, that time. Your Honor, may I have? Have permission to approach. You may. <clears throat> and I'm ask, would ask you if that helps refresh your memory as to the times that your dad indicated he gave her the drugs. Mm -hmm. No, it does. It does because I had written it down. And what times did he give her? the drugs that you indicated that were administered? Um, so he told me that he gave her the Arnica at 12 a.m., um, the Valium at 12 a.m., the Lortab um, at 1 a.m., um, the Phenergan at 1.30 a.m., uh, and then gave her two Percocets at 1.30 a.m., and then one Ambien at 1.30 a.m. The Zyrtec pad before you started using this black book? Um, I think it was three or four days, something like that. Not a hundred percent sure. Zyrtec pad? Uh, four days. For four days. Mm -hmm. Does it start with a certain day? Um, yeah, it starts with the, the day that um, my mom came back home after being discharged. And did you refer to that as day two? Yes. Okay, so that's... And so that would be day, day two. Day one would have been the surgery. Day of surgery. Day two would be the day after, yes. Okay. And then uh, you later started using a black book. Yes, I did. Did you memorialize the information from the Zyrtec pad on, into the black book? Yeah, I transferred everything over. Okay. Um, do you recall where you were keeping, where you kept this Zyrtec pad? Yes, I do. Where were you keeping it? Um, in my parents' room uh, by the armoire that they had their TV in. There was a little corner. Um, there was a little plastic set of, of drawers um, on top of the, the drawers is where all the medications I kept for my mom, as well as the the, the black book. Um, the Zyrtec I put in a couple of drawers. There's a few drawers down. I put put those in there. Okay. That in there. So ultimately this was separated from where the black book was. Yes, because the black book had all the rest of the thing, like the vitals and everything in it as well. Okay. So that morning you have this discussion with your father. Um, uh, did you stay with your mom that day? I did. And describe that day, if you will, what you did. 
Um, well, I'd been in there since about six in the morning. Um, I still was helping, you know, dress her, her, her wounds, um, and things like that. I was checking her vitals periodically, you know, trying to, to get her to fully, fully wake up. Can you, can you kind of describe for the jury her state throughout that day? How she was responding or not responding, things yeah. like that? Yeah, so initially, I mean, she really wasn't responding to any questioning or anything like that. I was trying to wake her up, say, are, you know, are you okay, are you okay? Um, but then throughout the day, um, it took a long time before she, she became uh, alert enough to, to respond to me and... Okay. Uh, despite her, at what point did she become, uh, I'll, use, I'll use the term lucid, um, uh, to actually speak and carry on a conversation with you? Oh. At what point would you say? Um, I mean, it was later on, later on in the day, um, would have been guessing early maybe early evening maybe early. where she was we were having you know where we could have like a full conversation so there was communication before then there was i what mean did she, that amount uh, well just you know little things she, like she'd groan and say ow you know i could tell she was hurting a little bit i mean she was able to talk a little bit but not you know i didn't have like a full conversation with her until later on in that evening Okay. Um, and I was, you know, I was checking her her vital signs throughout that whole that whole day. Okay. Did you administer medication to her throughout that day, even I, though she wasn't lucid and entirely? Yeah, even though she wasn't fully lucid, yeah, I was still at, at certain times, but it was it was. Uh, what mm -hmm. kinds of medications did you give to her? Um, you know, I'd have to refresh myself on that book, but I know um, in the BNE I would still do her little eye ointment and the hydrogen peroxide to um, to clean her her incisions, and then um, I believe in the early afternoon I gave her some ar maybe arnica, one of her, the herbal medications, and. Would day three of the Zyrtec pad, would that help refresh your memory as to what you did? That would, that would, because I wrote right, it down. Take a look at that for just a moment. Okay. Um, tell us what you were administering to her throughout that day, leading up to that evening. Okay. So at 9.45 in the morning, I gave her her eye ointment. Um, at 10 o'clock, I uh, dressed her incisions. Well, did the hydrogen peroxide polysporin as well. Um, and then at 12.50, she took uh, a methylprednisone, which is a steroid. And what is that? Is a steroid? It's, it's to help inflammation, basically to decrease inflammation. Is it a is it a in pill form? Yes. Okay. So so twelve by twelve fifty. So almost by twelve fifty. Yeah. I mean, she was lucid enough to swallow medications. So this was approximately almost seven hours after when from the time you first observed her in the morning. Yeah. Yeah. So it had been like I said, quite a while. And okay, what else did you? Um, at twelve fifty, um, I gave her Premarin. And what's Premarin? Premarin. Premarin. Premarin's an estrogen. Okay. Um. My mom had had a hysterectomy, a hysterectomy um, previously, and so she took estrogen pills. What about later? Um, at 2.45, um, I gave her one Percocet. Okay. Now, Percocet, that's a narcotic? Yes. Yeah, it's a pain medication. It's right? oxycodone and um, acetaminophen combined, so Tylenol and oxycodone. Okay. And do you recall uh, the purpose of why you would have given her a Percocet at that time? Because she would have been in pain or, you know, okay. saying that she's hurting. And this was at 2.45 in the afternoon? At 2.45 in the afternoon, yes. What, what, what happened next? At 4 o'clock p.m., she got uh, cephalexin, um, which is Keflex as well, which is um, uh, antibiotic. Okay. Um, 
um, at 515. She got some vitamin C and then another dose of her methylprednisone. And then at 7.15 p.m. at night, she had one Percocet. Okay. Uh, at 10.30, she had another methylprednisone. Now you described she woke up, mm -hmm. or you had a, I mean, she was lucid enough to converse with you mm -hmm. sometime later in the evening. Does this, does looking at this uh, day three of the Zyrtec pad, does this help clarify maybe about the time you would have? It does. Up? I mean, I know it was before my dad got home from work. Um, and he usually got home around six o'clock. Um, so you believe she woke, woke up and you talked, she was, uh, she was, yeah, she was back to more of a normal state by then where enough where I could speak with her and, and have, you know, a, a normal conversation. Okay. Um, and then you continue to administer medications to her help her out throughout that day after she had woken up yeah I did okay was there another Percocet that you administered to her later in the evening? at 11.05 p.m. she had one more Percocet okay um, you've indicated that she woke up and that you had a conversation I'll retrieve that now. okay what was that conversation I asked her what happened um, and, and spent a few minutes yeah since we talked about what happened yeah so you asked her what happened what is the what happened what happened because she was very sedated and over medicated when I went in that morning and she said Lexi I don't I don't know why but your dad kept giving me medication he kept giving me things telling me to swallow and she said I even started to throw up but then he started giving me more medication and kept giving me medication talked about how she had to drink even like the like the lower tab the elixir that my dad had dr. Thompson prescribed but um, she said that he kept giving her medication okay um, did she say anything to you about uh, well let's describe her demeanor as best you can she still has bandages on mm -hmm. her eyes and face yeah but uh, she was upset she was upset. How could you tell she was upset? Because um, I knew my mom. Um, I could hear it in her voice. Um, um, did she make any specific requests as far as how the medications would be administered to her? She said point? she said that she didn't want my dad to give her any more medicine, and that um, she actually had me take out every single pill from the pill bottles, and she wanted to feel what the pills fe felt like in her in her fingers um, so that if my dad tried to give her anything she'd know what he was giving her but she had me take out every single pill and she felt it in her fingers and I told her this is this medicine this is this medicine because at that time she couldn't see okay did that persist for a couple of days until the bandages were off as far as her, yeah, her feel? <laughs> yes But she said she didn't want my dad to give her any more medication. She wanted me to be in charge. Okay. Let's talk about maybe the rest of that week a little bit, or the, the days following. Um, did you continue to care for your mom? I did. In what way? Um, I, you know, I still helped give her her medications and keep track of her vitals and when her medications were given. Um, I helped her, you know, go to the bathroom, but over the next few days, I mean, she had her bandages coming off and uh, she was able to get up and, and, and walk around and do a lot herself, but I still stayed by her, her side. I helped her, um, I helped her wash her hair and do things like that as well. Okay. Um, so she's, she's getting up occasionally and she's... She was getting up a lot. I mean, not just occasionally, she was getting up all the time. When would you say that started as far as her getting up? Um, probably more when she got her the bandages off. So within, I'm guessing, about 48 hours of being home, she was she didn't like sitting in bed. So she was getting up and moving around. Okay. Were there any post-operative visits? There were. And uh, describe those. Um, I believe there were two post-operative visits. Um, 
first one, first one we just went to uh, and um, Dr. Thompson would just check the incisions and make sure things were, were looking good and that there wasn't any infection or things like that. Do you have a memory about how many days after surgery that would have been? <sighs> that would have been a couple days after. I mean, she had her eye bandages were off at that point. Okay. And you mentioned you thought there was at least one other? Yeah, I know there was one other one. Um, that was... What was the date on that one? That was April 10th. It was right before I flew back to Las Vegas. Okay. So surgery was April 3rd. Mm -hmm. April 10th was the final post-operative visit. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And did you attend those visits with your mom? I did. Do you recall who else was present? Um, my dad was present, I know for sure, at the April 10th um, appointment because he drove with my mom to drop me off at the airport. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that you were caring for your mom throughout in these throughout this period, these days. Mm -hmm. Were you doing other things around the house as well? You know, cleaning, cooking, doing, t taking care of the kids. Okay. Were you taking them to and from school and ballet? Yeah, I drop them off at their ballet classes or school and different things like that. Yeah. Okay. So it would it's not it wouldn't be fair to say you were with your mom constantly, twenty four seven. No. Seven. Well, and I mean, she really didn't need someone to be with her twenty four seven. She was, she was healing, and yeah. Initially, I was with her. Okay. A lot you recall more. your your father. Was he present during these days? Um, yeah. Um, did he stay home from work, or what was what was his presence in the home in those days? Um, no, I he didn't take any time off of work. Um, he just I he just come home normally at the end of the day. Okay. Um, let's talk about this last post-operative visit with Dr. Thompson. You, you indicated that that was April 10th? It was. Okay. And uh, describe what went on in this visit. Um, you mentioned that your dad was there. Yeah, my, my father was there. My mom was there. She was getting a few, um, I don't know if they were posts or staples, something Dr. Thompson was taking out of, off of her, out of her head where the incisions were. Okay. And... I remember her being really happy to have those out because she thought they were like little horns and she was joking with Dr. Thompson saying, good, no, you took my horns off, you know, just kind of joking around a little bit. Um, my father was there. He'd asked Dr. Thompson if uh, he could, if Dr. Thompson thought that my mom was doing well enough that he could take her on a cruise on Sunday. Your father said that? Yes. Okay. Um you recall what day of the week that was, April 10th? Um, well, Wednesday was April 11th, so it would have been a Tuesday. Okay, so he re was referring to a cruise that would begin that next Yeah, week. which surprised me and surprised my mom because he'd never said anything about taking her on a cruise before, but he asked Dr. Thompson. He said that he wanted to take her on a cruise on Sunday so she could have a full two weeks to kind of recover and relax. Okay. Um, describe your mom's, uh, like how was, how was she feeling, what she looked like during this last visit? She was, she was actually feeling really, really well. I mean, she was joking around and, um, she still had some bruising under her eyes. Um, the swelling, uh, still had some swelling, but most of the swelling had gone down quite a bit. Um, she had one bandage around her, her head. And where was that on her head? It was just just around her head this way. So horizontally, maybe in the forehead yeah, area, more of a around coronal type view. Yeah. And like the brim of a hat. Okay. Yeah, I believe I believe so. Not a hundred percent. I know she had an ace wrap around her head. Either it was that way or this way, but I think it was like when the brim you say of a hat. Way, it might have been underneath the chin. And yes. Over the head. Yeah. Okay. I don't think it was under the chin though. Um, how was she seen at that time? How, how, how sorry. She, was she seen? Was she? Oh, yeah, she was seen. Yeah, she was, we, you know, right after the appointment, we went out to dinner. She was out and about in public. Okay, was she, did she seem to be walking fine? Oh, yeah, she had no problem walking. Okay, so 
following the visit, you said you went to dinner. Where did you go to dinner? We went to dinner at Sizzler in Bountiful. Okay. And uh, do you have a memory as to what what you ate or your mom ate? I know my mom. She'd always get the teriyaki dinner with extra chutney. <laughs> did she have that meal? Yes, she did. Okay. And uh, do you recall who was present at the dinner? Yes, it was my mother, my father, myself, and Ada. Okay. Uh, what did you do after eating at Sizzler? First, first off, do you recall what what time of day that was? Um, that the meal was. It was. I mean, it was evening. Not a hundred percent sure on the time, but I'm guessing probably around five or six, six something like that. It was before my flight, and I. Okay. I think I arrived back in Vegas around eight, so it would be a one-hour flight. Yeah, so. I'm guessing five or six. Okay. Uh, so you then you then caught a flight after dinner? Yeah, I was dropped off. Okay. Uh, who dropped you off? Um, it was, we just drove directly from, from Bountiful to the airport. Um, it was my, my father and my mother and my little sister, Ada. Do you remember who was driving? My dad was driving. Okay, so your dad was driving. Um, prior to being dropped off at the airport, you'd been with your mom for several days. Mm-hmm. Can you describe what medications uh, you were giving as far as those that were, as far as the narcotics that were mm -hmm. prescribed? Oh. Um, she was taking very little. Um, maybe she was taking one or at the most two Percocet a day, but... Was she taking them like one pill at a time, two at a time? No, I'd normally give her a half, but most of her pain was actually really under control, and she was feeling she was feeling really well when I left. Okay. I wouldn't have left otherwise. Um, just for clarification, you mentioned a drug earlier called Arnica. Uh huh. What is, what is Arnica? Um, you know, I'm not a hundred percent familiar with it. It's I know it's an herbal supplement that I believe Dr. Thompson said that he prescribes to all his patients that helps with the bruising process. So okay. that's all I know about Arnica. I've never used that. I'm going to ask you specifically about some drugs. Um, Percocet. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned that she was down to one to two Percocet. At the most, um, I'd have to refer to that, to that book. I had everything. I was still writing down what I was giving my mom in that, in that black book, but, black book. but okay. it was gone. We're going to get there in a few minutes, but did the black book disappear? It did. What day did the black book disappear? April 11th, 2007. Okay. To ask you about Valium. Mm -hmm. uh, did you, do you recall ever giving your mom Valium during the week, those days that you cared for your mom? No, I never did. She didn't have, she wasn't having issues with any anxiety. Okay. You recall ever giving your mother Phenergan? No. And do you recall what the uh, prescription for the Phenergan was? What, what, what it came in, the form of the? Uh, I, the Phenergan was a suppository. Okay. And just for the record, a suppository is administered how? PR, uh, rectally. Okay. So you never administered Phenergan to your mom? No. Okay. Uh, what about Ambien? Did you ever administer Ambien to your mom? No, I didn't. She didn't have any issues with sleeping or having a difficult time sleeping and the other, the narcotics make you sleepy too, so she didn't, I mean, she never needed the Ambien. Okay. You did, however, administer Percocet throughout the week. I did. She was tapered down significantly. Yeah, we were, she, my mom didn't like taking medications, um, and she was sensitive to medications, so she would always try to take a lot less than what was prescribed to her. When you say she was sensitive to medications, um, I just... Uh, I guess I'm talking about narcotics. Okay, sensitive to narcotics. Uh huh. Um, did you have some experience of being with your mom then, uh, when she had pain or she was recovering from pain? Previously, Previously. through surgery. Yeah, she'd um, broken her arm back in 2000, 2000 to two thousand three. I don't know specifically what year, but um, yeah, I helped her when she was recovering from that as well, and they had prescribed narcotics. Okay. Did she take many of those narcotics back then? Mm -mm. Okay. No, she didn't like she didn't like narcotics. So when you say she was sensitive to drugs, that's based on your personal experience with your mom. Yes. Okay. No, she uh, always had a lot left over. Okay. 
So you, you caught a flight on the evening of April 10th to return home to Henderson, Nevada? Yes. Okay. And um, did you have school beginning shortly thereafter? or? Yeah, I had classes starting um, the following morning, the morning of the 11th. Okay. Um, you arrived in Vegas at the airport? Yes. Okay. Did you speak to your mother that evening yes. at any time? Mm -hmm. Okay. I did. I spoke when I when I got there because I know she'd want to know if I was safe. Uh, did you call her? I did. Okay. Um, did you ask her how she was feeling? Yes. And how did she respond? Well, she said she was feeling fine. She was getting back to, you know, kind of her normal routine. Okay. Um, the next day is April 11th. Yes. And we've already talked a little bit about how you found out your mother had died and you returned home. Mm-hmm. want to talk a little bit about that morning. Okay. Um, did you ever speak to your mom that morning? Yeah, I did. Okay. And do you recall about what time that was? Um, yeah, the last time I spoke to her, it was, um, it was before 8. Um, I think it's 7. Uh, I looked at my phone records, about 7.45. Okay. Would that have been uh, Las Vegas time, 7.45? Yes. Okay. So 8.45 Utah time. That's correct. Um, you talked with your mom. Did, mm -hmm. did you ask her how she was feeling? Um, yeah, I did. I, that's the first thing I asked her. How are you, how are you doing, Mom? I said she's doing great. She was happy. Um, she was getting up ready. She was ready for the day. Um, did she ever talk to you about her plans for the day? Yeah, she said she was going to pick up the girls from school. and. Was there a routine? They had ballet, and they had, you know, yeah, they had a very specific routine every day. Okay. When you talked with her... Um, that morning, did she was her speech slurred in any way? Oh, not at all. She sounded really, um, really upbeat and happy. I mean, I could hear it in her voice. Did she seem confused in any way, in not, the language or the type of voice she used? Not at all. Okay. Um, you remember where you were when you had this conversation with her? Yeah, I was in my um, apartment in Henderson. Okay. And what were your plans for that day? Where did you go after that? Uh, I went to school. I had um, an 8 o'clock lecture. Okay. Um, <coughs> did you ever um, receive any other phone calls? Did you receive a phone call from your father that morning? I did. Okay. And I, I missed the call because I was in my lecture. Um, I had my phone on silent. Um, but during the break, the lectures were usually 50 minutes long. And then uh, during the 10-minute break, I looked down. I saw that it missed a call from my dad, and there was a voice message. And what was the voice message? Uh, the voice message um, was my dad saying, Alexis, you need to call your mom. You need to call her right away. Um, she's not listening to me. She's getting up. She's out of bed. You need to call her and tell her she needs to rest. Okay. Um, how did you react to that? I thought it was strange. Um, thought it was actually really strange because my mom. I just talked to her. She was doing. She was doing well. Um, I'd just been with her, you know, the day before, and she wasn't in bed or bed bound. I mean, she was back to kind of her normal self. Okay. You mentioned that uh, you had talked to your mom about eight forty-five. That would be Utah time. That would be Utah time. Yeah. Um, do you recall? Uh, what time you received the message for the voicemail from your father, approximately? Las Vegas time, it was about 8, 10, 8, 15. Okay. So about 9, 15 Utah time. That's correct. Okay. Um, in response to receiving that, that call from your dad, that voicemail, what did you do? I called. I called home, called my mom. Okay. And uh, did you get a response? Uh, no, no one answered. You remember about what time that would have been? You mentioned there was a delay between the time you received the message but yeah. listened to it. So it would have been during my my break, probably around 9 o'clock um, Vegas time, which would be 10, 10 o'clock Utah time. 
Okay. So you called home and didn't get a response? No, I didn't. Okay. What did you do after that? Um, well, I had another lecture starting up, so I went back in and, and sat for my lecture. Okay. And did you finish that lecture? I did. Uh, what did you do after that lecture? I called home. Okay. And was there a response? Yeah, my father picked up the phone. And what did he say? Um, he said that your your mother's not breathing. She's in the bathtub. Okay. I've called an ambulance, and then he hung up. Okay. And we referred earlier to this conversation in this examination mm -hmm. today, correct? Yes, we did. Okay. Uh, you talked about grabbing a flight and coming home. Uh-huh. Um, and that you did return home to the home in Pleasant Grove. Mm -hmm. um, did you go straight from the airport to the home? I did. Okay. Uh, when you arrived home, what happened? I walked in the door. Um, I saw my brother and Eileen were, were in the living room. Um, I, gave, uh, I gave Damien a hug, and then um, I went uh, straight back into my, my parents' room. Okay. And what did you see in your parents' room? Well, I went, I went back there because I wanted to, to find the medication. That was the reason I went back there. But I saw um, that the room had been cleaned out. Um, Meaning the, what? Well, you know, just the night before, I mean, the hospital bed was there. And the hospital bed now was gone. Um, like little stuffed animals and blankets and things that were around the room were gone. Um, you know, all of the things that were there that night before okay. had been had been removed. You mentioned you went looking for the uh, the medications. What did you find or not find? I didn't find the medications. Where did you look specifically? I looked right where I'd left them, um, right on that little. <coughs> cabinet of drawers um, there was nothing there wasn't no medication and uh, that black book wasn't there as well so the black book was gone oh, yes you describe again where the black book was kept yeah just right I mean I I, I put it um, I put pretty much the medications like right on top of it as well so it was just a small little drawer that the medications were sitting on the top of this little chest of drawers and then the black book was there with it as well. Okay. Just a moment, Your Honor. I'm handing you what's been marked as State's Exhibit Number Forty Seven. You've referred to this, but can you describe what that is? Um, yeah, this is the, the Zyrtec pad where I initially was writing all of uh, my mother's medications on uh, following her, um, her facelift. And you've used that to refresh your memory today? I have. Some specifics? Yes. Okay. Um, where was that kept in relationship to the Black Book again? Um, I, well, since I had transferred everything to the Black Book, um, just shoved this in one of the drawers underneath Okay. Was that missing when you went looking for the drugs in the black book? No, this was there. So that survived. Your Honor, the state offers Exhibit 47. States. Any objection to 47? No objection. States Exhibit 47 is received. Day two, and then it shows it day three, and it lists the times of 12 a.m., 12 a.m., 1 a.m., 1.30 a.m., 1.30 a.m., and 1.30 a.m., and lists drugs next to that. That's can you clarify for the jury, and then there's, then it, then it jumps to 9.45 a.m., can you clarify what those first one, two, three, four, five, six, six times and drugs are in relationship to the others that are listed? Those are the medications that my dad gave my mom so the, the night before I found her uh, very sedated. So the Arnica, Valium, Lortab, 3-T-I, what does that mean? 
I think it, three tablespoons, because I think that was the liquid lure tub. And again, Percocet and Ambien. That's correct. Okay. Um, you didn't find the drugs. Mm -hmm. uh, did you look elsewhere for the drugs? I did. But first I... Oh. Well, go ahead. First, uh, the first thing I did was look for the medication, and then I asked my dad, where is the medicine? And what did he say? He said, I don't know, I think the police might have taken it. Okay. And then... And what did you do after that? Well, right after that... Sure. I, did, you, did you look for the medications anywhere else? I did. I did. Not specifically at that time. First, I asked my dad how he found my mom. Okay. But... Um, Let's talk about the medication, okay. and then we'll come okay. back to that. So, so yeah, I, I, went, I went looking around the house. I went, um, we kept medication in the, um, the kitchen as well. There was like a little medicine drawer we had. Um, didn't see it there. Went into the, uh, the garage because uh, I believe my dad had said that they'd taken a bunch of my mom's things out there. Okay, what um, did you find in the garage? Did you find the medications in the garage? No, I didn't find the medications anywhere. Okay. Did you find anything else in the garage? I did. What did you find there? Um, I found um, I found a pile of uh, wet towels and okay. some clothes. Okay. Um, uh, it was my... Uh, also found um, a rug from the bathroom. That was out there as well. And then there was a blue, um, like a Rubbermaid uh, gallon bucket or five gallon bucket that had um, some of the things that had been in my mom's room. Like what? Um, there was a humidifier there. Um, there was the blood pressure cuff, um, a few other things like that. Okay. Um. You mentioned that you went to your, after not finding the drugs, well, after speaking to your da dad about what happened to the drugs, mm -hmm. um, he wanted to show you something? Yeah. Okay. Let's, well, let's talk about that. After I, I spoke with, you know, asked him about where the medication was, um, I said, what happened? You know, okay. how did you find mom? And what did he do? Uh, he took me into the bathroom and showed me how he found my mom. Okay. I'm gonna ask you if you would just come down into the well here. And I first want to orient you to an exhibit that we're using for demonstrative purposes. Um, this bathtub, this red sticker here indicates the approximate location of where the faucet would have been on, on this tub. Does this appear to be a, an accurate reflection of the tub that was in your parents' home that your dad was referring to when he wanted to show you how he found your mother. Are you able to demonstrate to the jury, um, well, first describe what your dad said and demonstrate what he did, if anything? Okay. I'm sorry, I don't know if we're picking her up on the record. Okay. Could, are you going to ask her to describe what he said first? Yes, let's, we'll do that first. Could, could I ask you just to come back so that we get that on the record? Thank you, Judge. I'll, I'll just make a record. I was orienting the witness to the uh, demonstrative exhibit, which has been referred to as the tub here for trial purposes. Mm -hmm. Does this tub, this exhibit, appear to be a, uh, an accurate representation of the tub that was in the family home on April 11, 2007? Yeah, it is. Is this the tub that your uh, father used to when speaking to you about how he found your mother? Yes. Okay. Would you describe what he said in describing what he found? Yeah. He said that he found her slumped over the tub, um, her head down into the water, and her feet sticking out towards the back. Okay. Did he describe where her head would have been in relationship to the faucet? Um, been down by by the faucet. That's what, what's, yeah, slumped over, face face down, okay. covered with water. Her face was in the water. Face was in the water. Yeah. I have just a moment, Your Honor. You may.
is this does this exhibit here uh, this is not the actual tub is that no it's just the use of the representation of okay, the so same dimensions in the okay. tub so yeah. it's a replica of it same dimensions yeah to what I to what I remember yeah okay I'm gonna have you come down now into the well to the exhibit uh, well first off sorry. Did, did your dad actually physically demonstrate for you how he found your mother yeah he did he was um, so he his he, arms and in and head and put himself into the tub. Okay, we have you come down and let's demonstrate this to the jury and then I'll make a record as to what you're physically doing. Came to the side of it, there, there was a little step as well and uh, just put his, his hands and his head into the tub. Did he? So the, the witness is, is bending down towards the, the foot of the tub on the edge that's exposed to the tile, to the, to the room, and she's leaning down into the tub. Yeah, he got, he got pretty far into the tub when he showed him. And she's describing that the, the de defendant got pretty far into the tub in describing this. Uh, did he tell you where his feet, or where, excuse me, Michelle's feet were in relationship to her? So the feet were sticking out the back towards the foot of the tub. Was he actually slumped over, or was he? Did he, he was, just? He was slumped over, and that's how he said found her. But her feet were kind of facing to the back of where the wall was. Okay. She Thank. Was kind of pointing to that side, so it wasn't slumped over her feet this way. This way. Okay. Thank you, and I'll make a little bit more of a record. So when you demonstrate that, um, you're sort of slumped over into the tub, but your feet are still on the on the floor. Mm -hmm. When your father was demonstrating that, was was his, was his feet still on the floor when he was demonstrating yes, it? Yes, his feet were still okay. on the floor. But he described her feet actually sticking up out mm -hmm. towards the back of the tub, yeah. being the foot of the tub opposite from the faucet. That's correct. Okay. Um, did um, you ever ask him, or did he ever say anything to you about what he thought had happened to your mom? Yeah, he said uh, she may have slipped and fallen into the tub, and then he also said that she may have had a, a PE. A PE is what? It's a pulmonary embolism. Okay, you referred earlier to a blood clot. Uh -huh. What does a blood clot have in relationship to a pulmonary embolism, embolism. if anything? So a lot of times that's where the clot develops is in your lower extremities, your, your legs. Um, if you get a blood clot there, it can travel up your vasculature into your, into your heart and lungs and um, can cause severe problems, I mean, and death. Okay. <coughs> Did he ever say anything to her about maybe she was using the bathroom? And something happened you know I don't you know, well he, he thought that she was probably getting ready for a bath and slipped and fell or had a pulmonary embolism but he didn't say I don't believe anything else specifically did he ever describe to you what your mom was wearing when he found her yeah he said that she had um, garments on and a bra and a, a top and no, um, she didn't have any pants on or garment bottoms. Okay. She was naked from the waist down. Okay. When you went to the bathroom that day, April 11, 2007, and your dad's demonstrating this for you and mm -hmm. describing, uh, did you take a moment to look around the bathroom to see how was anything in disarray or anything like that? No, I mean, I noticed that the, the rug was was missing and I later found that out in the garage you know the little bath rug but um, now this rug um, <laughs> where was this rug in relationship to the tub it was just right below the little step going into the tub so just so you could step out and step onto a rug and wouldn't slip so just to the side of the tub then just in yeah on the outside just in, in the outside of it yeah okay um, did you look around the master bedroom at all and notice anything you, you, 
You I did. I, I looked around looking for the medication. Um, it wasn't there. Okay. Did you, by chance, ever look for garment bottoms or, a, or pants or anything like that? That you recall? I don't you recall. Okay. Um, I'm referring you to State's Exhibit Number 18. Do you recognize that? I do. And what is that? Um, that's a picture of Gypsy Jillian Willis. Okay. And at some point, did you come to know Gypsy Willis? Yes. And did she go by the name of Gypsy? Uh, she went by Jillian. Okay. Uh, do you recall the first time you ever met Gypsy Willis? I do. And approximately when was that and where was it? Uh, it was in my home. Um, this was right after I'd finished my, my finals, my first year finals, and it was driving home for the summer, um, and Gypsy was there at my house. Okay. I, I'm sorry, it was at your house in Nevada? No, sorry, um, at my house in Pleasant Grove. Okay. Thank you. My fam the family home. I, the that, was, that was home to me. Okay. Family home. Yeah. Um, In what capacity was she when you met her? I mean, did she have a, a role in the family? Um, yeah. Oh, well, my dad said she was the nanny. Okay. Did you did you have any knowledge of, of a woman named Gypsy preceding your mother's death? I did. That caused you concern? I did. Okay. Let's talk about that for just a little bit. Okay. Um, do you recall a conversation or an argument that you overheard between your parents, the defendant and Michelle? Um, prior to her death? I do. Uh, did the topic of gypsy come up? Yes. Uh, approximately when was this in relationship to your mom's death? So just a couple days before she died. Okay. And do you remember where this was? Yes. Um, my parents were in their, their bedroom arguing at the Pleasant Grove home. And where were you? Just outside of the door. Was the door shut, their door shut? Yes. Okay. And what did you overhear? Um, well, my mom, uh, was wanting my dad's phone records. Okay. Um, I guess we'll go into that a little bit later, but she wanted the phone records, um, so he could, she could see if he was still calling the number that belonged to Gypsy, Jillian Willis. Okay. Um, did he, did, did you hear her confront, what was was the defendant confronted with the suspicions of an affair? Yes. Okay. Yeah, my mom my mom had confronted him previously, but she confronted him again at that time and said, you know, I don't believe your story. Um, I want the phone records. I'm not going to let this die. That's what she said. Um, and this was in reference to Gypsy? To Gypsy, yes. Did she use the name Gypsy? Yes. Okay. Did you hear your dad's response? He told her that she was crazy. Um, he said that it's ridiculous, he's not having an affair. Um, he said that she couldn't get his phone records. Well, he had changed, so she went on She went on to log in to get um, his phone records. She had his password so she could access his phone records online. She went in that day again to access the new month's phone records and found that he had changed his password. Um, so she confronted him with that, wanted his new password. He, what did he say? He said that he couldn't give her the new password because his phone was owned by uh, Utah State because he was the medical director at the developmental center and said that um, that would be a violation. He, he couldn't have her look at the records because, I don't know if he used the word HIPAA violation or, or what, but he said that since it was a state record, she's not allowed to see it. Now you mentioned that there was that she had confronted him before about her suspicions of an affair. Yes. And it, with respect to a woman named Gypsy. Mm -hmm. How did you become aware of the name Gypsy? And when when did you become aware of that? Um, it was late March. Um, my mom had confided in me that she was concerned that my dad was having an affair. Um, 
And so I, uh, her request, took his, took his phone and was able to get his password for his phone records. Um, I logged in, we saw them online, and we saw that he had been calling a specific number. Did you check on that specific number? I did. I, I called it, I think, two or three times. Was, um, was this in the latter part of March? Yeah, I think, I think it was March 20th, around March 20th. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let me stop you for just a minute. You, uh, where were you at this time you were doing this? As far as physically, where were you at? I was back in Las Vegas. Okay. So you're, you're not in Utah. You're in school this time. Yes. Communicating back and forth with your mom. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, initially when I got the, the phone number, um, when I got into his password, I was in Utah. And then I had gone back to Vegas, and at the time when I was calling, um, we were in, I was back in, in Will Henderson. Okay. Um, did you come home frequently? I came home all the time. I mean, that was part of the reason I picked this school, because it was so close to home. Okay. I came back all the time. Like on the weekends and things like yeah, that? Yeah, I just drive up. Okay. Um, and during that process of checking on this phone number, you became aware that, that it, was, it belonged to a gypsy? Well, yeah, so first we saw the, this um, number that my dad had called, you know, really late at night or, um, and so we wanted, to, well, my mom wanted me to call to see if it was a female voice that answered. And, um, and was it when you called? It was. Okay. And then, so after that, I told my mom, yeah, it's a, it's a female. And so um, she had me, well, go on to online. It, it's called Intellis. Um, it's a place where you can put a phone number in and pay, I think it was like 60 or 70 bucks to, okay. to figure out who, whose name was associated with that phone number. Did you register for that? Yes. Did you pay the fee? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what was the result? Um, Gypsy Jill and Willis. Willis. Okay. <coughs> and you communicated that to your mom? Yes. And approximately when that would that have been? That's about March twentieth. March twentieth. It would have been that as soon as I got that confirmation that it was a female voice. We did it. I did that immediately. Okay. That Intel is search. Um. Did you ever see um, Gypsy Willis in the home functioning as a nanny? or in her role as a nanny? Um, no, I mean, I, I really never saw her do any, what I would consider what, 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 nanny. What did you see? Um, I saw her, I mean, just come and go throughout, throughout the day, not, I never saw, well, I never saw her pick up the children or do any cooking or cleaning. Um, I saw her following my dad around a lot. Um, I saw them leaving together often. Um, I don't believe I ever saw her cook at all, I don't think. Okay. But she kind of just was there. When did you first, um, when were you first made aware of, of Gypsy being the, the nanny for the family? Um, this was shortly after my, mo my mother's uh, funeral, probably within a week after her funeral when I was back down in in Henderson. Um, How did you become aware of it? My dad called me on the phone and said, Alexis, I've found the perfect nanny. Did and, you ask what her name was? Or did he tell you her name? Yeah, I said, well, Dad, what's her name? And he started to say, he said, Jill, I said, Dad, Gypsy Jillian Willis, I know that woman. I know Mom was worried you were having an affair with her, and you're not to bring her into this home. And how did he respond? Oh, he got irate. He was screaming at me, saying, how dare you? How dare you accuse me? You know, and hung up on me. Okay. He just, he didn't know that I knew. On the, shortly after your mother's death, um, are you aware of, of whether or not uh, your father talked with the medical examiner? Um, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, and, and the medical examiner is the person that performs an autopsy on the deceased? Yes. Okay. It was uh, Dr. Maureen Fricke. Okay. Um, how is it that you know that your father spoke with Dr. Fricke? Because he had, he had her on speakerphone when I was there in the room. And um, when would this have been in relationship to your mom's death? It would have been the day after her death. Okay. And you were present in the room with him? Was I know it? he talked to her on a couple occasions. A couple of occasions. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, it was on speakerphone, you say? Yes. You could overhear Dr. Fricky. Mm -hmm. um, what did what did what was your dad telling the medical examiner? Um, he was just kind of telling her what had happened that day. Um, you know how he found my mom. Um, did he describe? He for, yeah, sorry. Did he describe how the position of your mom's body when he found her? He did. And was that consistent with what you've testified today as to what your dad? demonstrated to you? Yes. Okay. Uh, what he, else? Did he, he also was talking to her about the medications um, that she had been taking. Um, he did ask her if she found anything abnormal. And uh, she said, yeah, she didn't have a, a uterus. And they both laughed. Do you recall if he ever... Um, offered an opinion as to what he thought happened to your mom? To her specifically? To Dr. Fricky. You know, I don't recall right off the top of my head. Okay. You remember, was anyone else present for this conversation on the day after your mom's death? You know, I think Rachel may have been, been in there during certain points in the conversation. Um, I'm not 100% sure. I know she didn't want to hear any details. Rachel didn't want to hear any details? She didn't. I mean, she didn't want to hear about my mom's autopsy. Okay. Um, are you familiar with your mother's bathing habits? Yes. And, and how so? How would you be familiar with those? Because that was my mom's favorite thing to do was to take a bath. Um, it's kind of the way that she'd relax, too. Um, you know how often she would take a bath? I mean, several times a week. Okay. And um, was this throughout her life, growing up with her? Mm hmm She liked this? Yeah. Okay. Are you aware of whether or not she had a specific habit as far as how she would take a bath and the process of drawing a bath and so forth? Yeah. Yeah, no, I know. I knew exactly. I'd seen it so many times. Um, and what was that? Well, she'd start the bath water up, and then she'd get in it and turn it up as hot as it could go. She liked it really, really hot. Okay. And then once it was full, she would turn off the water? Yes. Okay. Do you know if she ever drew a bath and filled the bath up first and then got in? Objection, Your Honor, calls for speculation. Uh, su sustained, you may inquire about her hab routine habit. Okay. Um, how often did you see your mother bathe? Or the process of probably hundreds of times when I was little I used to sit up there to him put my feet in <laughs> okay. so I mean I saw her did you see her prepare a bath oh yeah hundreds of times just, okay and um, you mentioned hundreds of times throughout my life yeah definitely throughout your life you did um, did she consistently draw a bath in the same way yes as you've described she would turn the water on and then get in, mm -hmm. and then turn the water off after she's already been in. That's correct. Did at any point you ever see her uh, turn the water on, fill the bath, and then get in? Mm -mm. Okay. I don't recall ever seeing her do that. Okay. Um, Alexis... I haven't asked you about your relationship with your mom. Can you describe your relationship with your mom? Uh, yeah. Um, my mom was my best friend. Um, she was someone that I... Um, I was always around her. Uh, she was kind of like my superhero when I was 
tried to be her sidekick, you know. She was someone that I just, um, I adored. Um, she confided in me a lot, and I did the same with her. Um, she was my mom, you know. Your Honor, I will, I will, just one moment. Back to the conversation you overheard with Dr. Fricky, mm -hmm. the medical examiner, did you want, were you curious, did you want to be there? I wanted to know what happened. Okay. Um, with respect to, your father demonstrated and described how he found your mom in the tub that morning, mm -hmm. April 11th, 2007. Did he make any statements to you about the water being on or off? when he walked into the room? I don't specifically recall. I can have just a moment, Your Honor. You may. Did you have occasion to email investigators in this case information about the investigation? Yes, throughout the years I've definitely emailed okay. them. If I were to show you an email that talked about the issue at hand, would you think that may help refresh your memory? The as issue to what, as to what your father may have told you? Yeah. You may. Handing you this document, I'm just going to ask you to read for a moment the uh, final paragraph on the second page of this document. Just read that to yourself. Okay. Is that language from, from an email that you sent to an investigator in this case? Yeah, that is. Is there a date on that email? 8-7-2008. Um, so in 2008. Mm -hmm. um, is it fair to say your memory would be more accurate back then? Yeah, definitely. And does that help refresh your memory as to whether or not your father discussed water? So um, when he found, yes. What did he say? He, he told me that when he found my mother, the water was off and the tub was full. Okay, so the water was no longer running. Yeah. Looking at this, have you ever bathed in, in your, your parents' tub where your mom was found deceased? Yes, before she died, yes. You haven't bathed in that tub since her death? Well, it took a long time for me to take a bath. Are you familiar with what this is on the tap right here? And I'm pointing to the faucet end up towards the lip. Um, that be where the water would would drain if it was overfilling. So that's an, this is an overflow drain. Okay, is that the name of it? Okay. Is that consistent with what you? Would that's what I would think it would be. Okay.
taking you back to the final post-operative visit with Dr. Thompson. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that you were there along with your mom and dad. Of course, Dr. Thompson and then Ada was there, you, you think, also. Um, are you aware of any additional prescriptions that were filled on that day or that were re re requested by anyone? Um, on that final day? I'm not 100% aware of. I don't, I don't remember. Okay. Did you ever have a conversation with your dad about your mom's upcoming plastic surgery, the reason she was having the surgery? Um, I did. Well, when I talked to him about it, just initially. Initially, yes. Yeah, he said he was giving it to her as a present. Okay. He'd surprised her with the plastic surgery. Okay. As a as a present. Council and I have a stipulation with respect to the foundation to admit States Exhibit 48. These are some telephone, cell phone records from Alexis McNeil, uh, at the time Alexis McNeil, now Alexis Summers, and Michelle McNeil. State offers 48. Any objection to 48? No objection. 48 is received. I'm just going to place it here for you, Your Honor. Very good. Um, I'm just going to ask you about some phone numbers. Mm -hmm. um, Do you happen to recall your cell phone number at that time? No, it's, I don't remember what it, what it was. If I can approach your own. Mm -hmm. Handing you a, a handwritten document that looks like you created. Uh -huh. um, I'm just going to ask you a few questions. Uh, does, would that help refresh your memory as to your phone number and your yes. father's phone number and your mom's phone number? Yeah, it has them all, it has uh, them all listed. Mm -hmm. What it, what was your cell phone number at this time, the relevant time of this case? Um, 801. And what about your father's cell phone number? One. An 801, uh-huh. Is it an 801 prefix on your phone as well? Yes. Okay. I'm sorry, it was 70. Thank you. So, I have, so 801, 319. family home in Pleasant Grove? 801-785-7588. Um, your father's 
a work phone, direct line. When you would receive a, a phone a call from your dad, um, and so it would show up on your phone, would mm -hmm. it show up as a different number than his direct line? Yeah, if he was ever calling from work. If he was calling from work. Uh -huh. How would that show up on, on the phone? It would show up as 801. And then lastly, you mentioned that you had, <laughs> had called Gyp Gypsy Willis's phone yes. a couple of times in March. Uh -huh. And what was the phone number that you would have called? Um, 801. Thank you. I'll retrieve. Okay. With that, Your Honor, the state would tender the witness. How long do you think you would be on cross? Probably a little more than an hour. Okay. Why don't we break for lunch then? Ladies and gentlemen, uh, please keep in mind my prior admonition to you. You're not to form or express any opinion about the case until it's finally submitted to you for deliberation. Don't do any research on your own using a computer or something else. Avoid television, internet, and news, other, other news coverage of the trial. And it's your duty not to discuss any subject of the trial with each other or with anyone else that you might see uh, during the lunch hour. We will reconvene at 1 o'clock. Courts in recess. All rise.